We sure do love Pomona. Pastor Aaron is so engaged in the community in Pomona, even to the point where there are um, politicians and political leaders who don't even really go to church or even have faith in Jesus, and they're using our hashtag, labor for your neighbor, because this is the year of neighborhood watch. They're even using that in their city on the city website and pages. They're hashtagging labor for your neighbor. So talk about an impact and an influence. It's absolutely incredible. Well, hey, we want to jump in and get started for today's message. So if you have your Bible, your iPad, would you turn to Matthew chapter 4? And uh, if you don't have your Bible or even an app on your phone, that's okay because today we're going to have the verses up on the screen. And if you walked in and got a paper note, you can see all the verses there that I've listed there. But, um, you know, if you want it tactically in your hand, you go to Matthew chapter 4 and you can kind of hold your place uh, right there as we begin begin to open up today. And so today as you're taking notes and you may have looked at your notes, we're going to be speaking about uh, the raw Christian. Or if you came last week, Pastor Diego talked about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And we're not called just to be Christians, but we're called to be disciples. So you can also call today the raw disciple as well. God has called us to be raw Christians. How many of you guys know, generally speaking, when you use a terminology raw in regard to referencing a person, it's generally a good thing. You maybe introduce someone and say, hey, this is my friend John, you'll like him because he's a really raw person. Usually means when you hear that, that person's authentic, what you see is what you get. When you meet them and what they say and how they come off is who they are. There's no secret side to them. And how many of you guys know the kingdom of God needs some raw Christians? They need something. What you see is what you get. Or what you see is what you shouldn't get. We come into church on Sunday and we look good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We wear our Sunday best. Praise and worship. We lift our hands. But then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there's another kind of Christian that comes out of us. We're not, it's not raw. What I see is not what I get. There, there's another side to you. And what Jesus looks for and what he teaches us to be is he teaches us how to be a raw Christian. And that's an acronym today that we're going to be sharing, R-A-W. But today as we break it down and we see what a raw Christian looks like, we begin first in seeing the promise of Jesus. Because it's often important to understand that in the Bible, there is 100% prophetic words and verses. Verses that are in it. And when I say prophetic, it means that there is a verse that states something and in the future it is revealed. You can see it. So there's a promise in the Old Testament and it'll be revealed in verses prophetically in our lives. And so we start off in Genesis 3.15. In theology school, it's known as one of the most famous verses in all of theology and divinity school that we would go through as pastors in Genesis 3.15. And I'm going to read it right now. What happens is, is this is right after the fall. This is right after the serpent tempts Adam and Eve, and they eat of the fruit of knowledge of the tree of good and evil, and now they become fallen into sin. And so God tells Adam, as a result of sin and what you did, labor, hard work is going to be difficult toil for you. He says you're going to have the sweat of your brow on you when you work. And then he says for you, Eve, for eating the knowledge of tree of good and evil, childbearing is going to be very difficult for you. It's going to be painful for you. And all the mothers can relate to that. Now he looks at the serpent. He looks at Satan, the one who caused them to fall, and he speaks to him. And he has something to say to him. And it's seen in Genesis 3.15, as I have it up on the screen. It says this. This is God speaking to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and put your offspring and between her, your offspring and her offspring. That's us. We are offspring and Eve. We live in a constant conflict and tension between Satan and us. It is Satan's goal to get you to fall the same way that Adam and Eve fell. That is what he desires of you. He desires of you to give into your flesh, give into your temptations, give into your addictions. That is what he desires. Because when you do it, it creates a separation between you and God, like he did with Adam and Eve. And so he says, then he says, between you and your offspring, then he says, you shall, he shall bruise your head 
and you shall bruise his heel. You see, the Hebrew word for bruise here is it creates, there, there's, it has multiple meanings depending on the context. So it can mean bruise, but it also can mean crush. And so here we look at the serpent. He says, he will bruise your head, speaking to the serpent, speaking to Satan. The offspring of Eve will come and he will bruise your head. Or in other words, he will crush your head. Because when you're out in the forest or the mountains and you come across a snake, you don't want to step on its tail. You want to step on its head and make sure the job is done. But if a snake gets you before you can get it, it's going to go for your legs because that's all it can reach. And so this is called a prophetic verse and in other words, in theology school, we're taught it's called the proto-evangelum. In other words, the first good news. Adam and Eve caused us to fall in sin. Thanks, mom and dad. Like, introduce death, disease, decay, pain, addiction, all of those things. And so it's like, man, now what happens? Well, God makes a promise and he tells it to Satan. He says, there's going to come a day where there's going to be a child that comes from Eve and he is going to crush your head and you are going to try to bruise his heel. In other words, he is going to put to death hell in the grave and you're going to put him on the cross, Satan. You're going to kill him. You're going to bruise him. Oh, but three days later, you're not going to succeed. Jesus is going to resurrect. (laughs) Bruise his heel. So Satan's going to, his attempt to try to come after Jesus, it's going to be thwarted. He's going to fail. But Jesus doesn't fail. He's going to crush the head of Satan. It's known as the first good news that we can ever record in the Bible of the coming of the gospel, the promise of Jesus. And so that's what we hold to and that's what we'll visit today because literally from that promise in Genesis 3.15, There is no interaction really specifically between Jesus and Satan until now Matthew chapter 4, which is what we're reading today, where Satan attempts to tempt Jesus and stop Jesus from saving all of humanity. He does not want Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He wants to kill and obliterate Jesus, but he does not want him to resurrect. He does not want him to finish his job that he came to do. So he's going to try to tempt Jesus to pull him away from his purpose. And that's what Satan will try to do for you and I. He will try to tempt you. He will try to course you to pull you away from your purpose. When you're married, he will try to tempt you and course you with someone else to try to thwart you from your purpose in your family. In your business, he will try to tempt you and thwart you and pull you away. Have you be dishonest? Have you lie? Have you cheat? He will try to pull you away. On, on your way to work in traffic, he will try to pull you away. When you're at the movie standing in line to see Avengers and that family of 15 cuts in line from you because one person was in front, it's going to try to tempt you and make you lose yourself. But here's the beauty. If, I believe that if you take notes today and you let the verse and the message today saturate you in your heart, this isn't a promise of mine. This is a promise of the scriptures. Any test and temptation you ever face in the future you can 100% overcome it every single time if you hold to this. If you can get today's message in your heart, doesn't mean you'll win every single time, but you will see far more wins than you've ever seen in your life. Because Jesus gives us an example of how to respond to temptation. And when Jesus shows us, I tend to wanna pay attention. My parents, they never want me to tell them how to do something. How do you do this on the phone? How do you do this on the TV? And I start to explain it, hit the home button. No, no, get over here. I want you to show me how to do it. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I want you to show it to me. That's what Jesus did. Jesus goes, I'm not gonna tell you what to do when you go through temptation and you face the trial. I'm gonna show you in Matthew chapter four what you're to do when you face the temptation and trial. And that is where we see today, and that's where we see what a raw Christian looks like. And we start in Matthew chapter four, verse one today, if, you're, if you have your Bible. This is where we're gonna start and read, and we're gonna go down and share three simple points. It says this, 
Then Jesus, after he was baptized, so now he's baptized, he's about to start his ministry, 40 days in the desert. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, as any person would who didn't eat or drink for 40 days or 40 nights. And the tempter came and said to him, if... You are the son of God. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So right now, what happens is we see three levels of temptation Jesus is going to go through. The first temptation that Jesus is going to be challenged with is who does he rely on for strength when weakness sets in? So if you're taking notes today, the raw Christian, R-A-W, it's an acronym. The first part to being a raw Christian means reliance. What it means to be reliant on God. That is what God desires for you and I. He wants us to totally rely on him. That is why his word has been given to us. It's amazing how Jesus, who's the son of God, in the face of temptation, he could say a million things in the world. He can create whatever statement. He could throw Satan off a cliff. He could do whatever you want. He's Satan. Or he's Jesus. He's the son of God. But instead, he responds and he says, Satan, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the words that come from the mouth of God. So Satan begins to challenge Jesus. And he says, if you're the son of God, remember 40 days prior, Jesus was baptized. God descended like a dove. And he said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased in. So he's trying to challenge Jesus now. You really think you're the Messiah? You really think you're the son of God? Prove it to me right now. You're hungry. Why don't you make some bread out of stone? Back like God did with the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. Why don't you do it right now, Jesus? And Jesus looks at Satan, and he uses the authority of the word of God, and he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that precedes the mouth of God. What do we often call this when we reference the Bible? We call this the word of God. So what Jesus is saying is that when Satan tempts me, it is my responsibility to use this as a response to temptation. I need to exercise the power, the strength, the authority, and the miracle of God's word. And there's only one way to use this. It's to know it. I wish there was an easier way. I wish there's a way where I could go to bed at night and I could put this under my pillow and I wake up and I have everything seeped into my brain to use. I wish I could be that lazy and just do that. But the problem is you wanna go get your real estate license, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go study. You wanna go become a police officer, what are you gonna go do? Go study. You wanna go be an electrician, what are you gonna do? You're gonna study. Anything worthwhile, anything that takes the ability to do something well, it takes study. And we want to be a Christian and we don't want to study? This is why so many Christians lose in the kingdom of God. It's not because we don't have the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that we just don't know it. And we don't know how to exercise it. So what Jesus is teaching us is he's saying when you face a trial, a temptation... When Satan is shooting those arrows at you, he says, you need to take that word of God and you need to wield it. Jesus says, it is written. What is he doing? He is quoting scripture. Specifically, what he's quoting is he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, where it says this. And he humbled you. He's quoting the Old Testament. That's what Jesus did. He humbled you and let your hunger and fed you with manna. This is the Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness which you did not know, nor did your father know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So why is it that the Israelites were not provided food just miraculously until they waited on the word of God? It's so that they know in their lives that nothing, there's no breakthrough, there's no winning, there's no overcoming without waiting and using the word of God. 
So God has purposed that we use his word as an activator in our lives. It's a form of getting heaven to move by using the word of God. It's a resort that Satan fears the words of God. And so it moves them. And so the only way we can do that is through our preparation process. In other words, you know, famously, we know in the scriptures, the Bible talks a lot about fruit. And, and the Bible talks about the fruit of the spirit, talking about love, joy, peace, patience, steadfastness. The Bible talks about fruit of the spirit. Also, towards the end of Jesus' ministry, when he was walking into Jerusalem, he walks up to a tree to get a fruit. And it looks like from afar that it looks like it's a tree that bears a lot of fruit. But when he gets up to it, it has no fruit on it. And so Jesus curses the tree. And the next day the disciples return and they see that the tree has decayed and died. And basically Jesus responds and says, what good is it for a tree to look the part but bear no fruit? And he was illustrating a Christian, a Christian who comes and they look good and they wear a cross necklace on them and their Instagram says Jeremiah 29 11. And when they come to church, they post my happy place when they're at church and all that kind of stuff. But then when Monday sets in and it's time to bear some fruit, we're a tree that looks good, but there was nothing to us. And the purpose of a fruit is actually to be consumed, to be ingested. That is the purpose of what fruit is supposed to be. So this orange is meant to be sliced open and enjoyed. So when we bear the fruit of God and we use the word of God, it's meant to be ingested into us so that it can strengthen us. How many of you guys have had two cheeseburgers at In-N-Out before? And if I told you, let's go to the gym and go for a jog. You're like, no, I feel like a roly poly oly right now. I'm not going nowhere. But if you and I were to go get a salad and have a couple pieces of fruit, and I say, you want to go for a walk or a jog? You say, yeah, I feel great. I, I got energy. I just ate some superfoods. I had an acai bowl. I'm strong. I could do it. Yeah, let's do it. That's because when you ingest what's meant to be healthy for you, it's meant to be something that activates your energy. And that's what the word of God is meant to do. That as you ingest it, when temptation comes and trial comes, you now have the recollection of the scriptures to be able to use them in your difficult time. So in other words, I have this orange and it's meant to be waited on and it's meant to be used and it's meant to be juiced. You're supposed to wait on the scriptures and ingest the scriptures and read the scriptures and memorize the scriptures and, and repeat the scriptures. And that is what God has created to get you and I through difficult times in our lives. And so here I have some oranges and I have a juice press and as I begin to read the word of God and I do that effort of reading and memorizing and as I read the word it says by this we know that we are children of God. When we love God and we obey his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. That our faith, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is son of God? And then I go over here and then I see in verse 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with the punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. There is no fear in love. So then as I do that, I'm reading the Bible, I'm walking away and I'm still putting the word. There's no fear in love, perfect love casts out fear. So when my wife comes and tells me, says she's not happy with this marriage, I have to go back to the scripture. And I have to say, perfect love casts out fear. I'm, I'm not going to be scared. I'm not going to be troublesome. Or when I go to the doctor's office and I get a diagnosis, I'm going to wait on the scriptures and I'm going to begin to juice them and use them. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to walk in fear. He who's in me is greater than he is in the world. So now as you've done the labor and the work, when it's time that you actually need the scriptures in your life and you walk in the office and, you're, and your company tells you, we're gonna have to do some let goes right now. We, we have some setbacks, we're gonna have to let you go. You sit there and you go, okay, I got some scriptures for this right now. I know that I'm a child of God 
and that I can go through, according to 1 John chapter 5, I can go through the throne room of grace and anything, God, I don't know how I'm going to go back to my family and tell them I don't have a job, but I know that your promises and your word, that if you supply the birds of the air food for nourishment, then I need no worry. Ah. That's just what I needed. Thank you, God. I'm good. Instead, you got Christians like coming to church on Sunday, like, let me do it again. A little something. Got pastor to pray for me real quick. I need a little something. I just need God to move right now. Couldn't you find out that news two weeks ago? What'd you do two weeks ago? I've just been waiting until I have the time to come to church and I just need a little something. You know, you could have done something the day that you went through what you went through, and you didn't need a physical building to get through it. You have everything that you need in the palm of your hands, in your phone that you walk with you. That is where the authority is. It's not in a person. Every single time that you felt t transformation when you've come to church, where you felt deliverance, I don't know if you've ever been to church before and you walked out and you said, I feel free. God just lifted a burden off of me. The only reason why that happened was because the word was preached. It was not the speaker. It was the word of God. And you know that you can have that on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It does not need to happen because I wish... I wish that God would give us a calendar on when our trials would happen. I wish, I wish he would tell me, Adam, on June 22nd, you're going to have some issues happen. It's going to be some financial issues, so start holding out. Start coming to church. Start building up your faith, because when that day comes, you're going to be ready. Or on October 12th, your wife's going to come to you, and she's going to tell you she's not happy in her marriage. So Adam, start. There's your calendar of when your trials are going to happen. Or Adam, on July 4th, there's going to be a person that cusses you out at the grocery store. So just get ready for it, Adam. And I'll say, okay, okay, that'll be a good day for me. But that's not the way it happens. It can hit you in the parking lot of Abundant Living Family Church. What's going to happen when that sets in? What's going to happen when work comes and they say, hey, could you just sign this document and say that th this thing happened and that thing happened? I know it didn't, but it'll really help. Could you just lie on that real quick and sign that? And you're like, oh, shoot, what am I going to do? I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose that. What's going to happen? At what point are you going to be filled? Because Jesus did not say if you want to overcome temptation, you come to church. He, he didn't say if you want to overcome temptation, you just got to lay at the altar and praise and worship. He says when you overcome temptation, he goes, you have to quote, it is written. And where is it written? It's written in the word of God. That is what we're called to do. So the first part is God is teaching us what it means to be reliant. That's why Deuteronomy chapter 8 is quoted. That's why Jesus is showing us in him temptation. He's going back to when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they needed food and they had to rely on the word of God. They could not, they were in the desert. There was nothing else to rely on. They left Egypt. They had no one and nothing. And that's why some of them groaned and said, well, in Egypt, we at least had food and water to drink. Why do we got to trust God? It's because when you rely on God and he does a miracle, he gets the credit for the miracle. Because you know that it was him and not you. So the second thing that happens in the second temptation is Jesus shows us who has the authority. So reliance are A, authority. Shows us who carries the authority. Jesus responds to saying, who carries the authority of heaven and earth. In verse 5, he says this. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if, again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What does he use one more time? He uses scripture. And it's because Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says this, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, which is the day that I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne room of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace 
in the help of time of need. What the author of Hebrews is telling us is that Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, he faced every temptation that every natural human would face. And so when you and I go through a trial and a test and a tribulation and we go to the throne room of God and we use scripture as the authority, Jesus is in heaven and he looks to the father and he says, I've been there. I know what they're going through. We got to do something. We got to move heaven for Joe. We got to move heaven for Stephanie. We got to move heaven for Jane because I see what she's going through and I know that pain because I once was on earth. He can sympathize with what you're going through through the, through the authority of relying on God. That's why people often ask me, Pastor Adam, because we rely on so many crazy things in this world. We rely on crystals and candles and sage and, 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 and we rely on, on, um, on auras and vibes and we rely on other things like the um, uh, philosophy, what's the terminology? The, the, the what? Horoscopes. People ask me, Pastor Adam, is it wrong that, for me to believe in my horoscope? Me to trust in my horoscope? And I ask them, what does it matter when you have the Word of God and you have Jesus? Why do you need your horoscope? Why does it matter if you were born in August? God can do something in January the same way he can do something in August. He can do something in July. It's not a good month for me, it's March. It's not, my, the stars tell me it's not my year. What? What? So they ask, can I tell them? It don't, I, I mean, I don't care. I don't do it, but do it. The same way if someone came to me and said, Pastor Adam, is it wrong if I put water in my car? Can I do it? Yeah, you can do it. You're crazy if you do it, but you can do it. Technically, you could get a gallon of water and put it in your car, but you're not going nowhere. So when people ask me, can I do this? Can I do that? As a Christian, can I do? Fill your car up for water for all I care. Wake up and look at March 17th, something, something. Today's going to be an angry day. I don't care, but you're putting water in your car and you're not going to go anywhere. The only way that you can go somewhere is by the word and favor of God in your life. That's the only way to get to it and through it. I wish there was another way. I wish that we could all put salt crystals next to our bed to take bad dreams out. But that is not the way that God created it to be done. God does not want you to rely on a crystal, a salt, a piece of this, a piece of that. That's, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to rely on him. And in relying on him, he may have given us something in his creation that assists us. But that is not what he wants. That was not his desire. His desire was reliance on him. And the reliance on him is he's the one who carries the actual authority in our lives. And it's when we use the word of God as an authority does Satan tremble because Satan gets scared of God's word. <laughs> Satan does not get scared at Adam, but he gets scared the fact that God is in Adam and he's in me. And when I call upon the name of Jesus and I use the word of God, that's when things start to change. Because if it didn't, why would Jesus be quoting scripture already two times now in the face of temptation? Why didn't he change it up now and quote something else? Quote himself, as I say. Why don't you say that? He didn't. He quoted scripture again because he's trying to teach us something. You want to get through it, you're going to have to understand the word of God. And so one of the greatest things that I used when I first got saved, and uh, they were on index cards, and I bought them online. You can still get them, but they also make an app of it now. It was called Fighter Verses. And I'd have them on these index cards, and once a week, you got a new index card, and you memorize it. You'd memorize scripture so that when you had to fight against spiritual warfare, they were, the, they were verses that were specifically designed to get you through your temptation and your trial. They were called Fighter Verses, and now they actually make an app for it. 
it that's free in the App Store that you could download in the App Store and you can start to memorize verses that are used for battle and spiritual warfare. Because the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the spiritual world and principalities. So whatever trial that you face, there is a natural aspect to it, but there is a demonic spiritual aspect to it that is trying to pull you away from God. And so it's always trying to draw you, and it's a fight. That beautiful coworker, and you're married, and they keep on wanting it. For some reason, they always end up at your cubicle asking for a pin in your office. And you think, how am I going to fight this thing? Because me and my wife and her husband are going through it, and this person's really attractive. How am I going to go this thing? It is not a natural fight you're going through. You are going through a spiritual battle. And unless you use some spiritual world words that can fight Satan, that's when we start to lose in temptation. So we see that we're called to be reliant on God. The second part is we see the authority that's held in the word of God. And then the last point is, is Satan begins to test the amount of worldliness that is in Jesus. He wants to see how much world, because Jesus came to regain this world, but not regain the land, to regain the people in this world. But Satan gives him a temptation to say, Jesus, if you want the world, I'll give it to you. Let, let's, let's quit the cross. Let's quit the resurrection. Let's just stop it all now. I'll, I'll give you what you want, but you just got to do one thing for me. And it's, in, and it's, uh, it's seen in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him. So now, first time didn't work. Second time didn't work. Again, the devil took him to a very high ma- mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. Once again, what does he say? For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. He says, again, as it is written, let me use the word of God one more time on you. You worship no one else but the Lord your God. And then it says, Satan left. I imagine Satan was like, man, man, come on. They ain't balling for it, man. He didn't do the bread. He didn't do the loaves. And then it says the angels came and were ministering to him. So the way that I imagine it, because I love movies and other things, I, I imagine what's going on here. So I imagine the angels came down and were ministering to Jesus. And they were just celebrating like, like, yo, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, man, you remember when Satan came to you? And he was like, hey, turn that stone into bread. And you looked at him and were like, hey, man, I don't live by bread. I live by the word of God. Yo, that was crazy, Jesus. But you did that. That was wild. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, remember every time we'd say, he says something, you would say, as it is written. Yo, that's crazy, man. Yo, that's wild. You're doing that, man. How you do that, Jesus? Man, you showed him. And then, and, then, and then remember when he took you to the cliff, the pinnacle, and then you looked at him, and you said, I don't worship anyone but the Lord your God. And then Satan was like, man, you're right. No, you got him, man. You jokes, bro, man. He tried, he tried to keep you. And then, oh, Jesus, Jesus, I mean, I forgot. Remember when he showed you the world? And he said you could have it? <laughs> Satan really thinks it's his, but you know you're about to do it. In three years, you're about to die and resurrect and save all of humanity? Satan is stupid, man. That was good, Jesus. That was good, man. That's how I imagine the ministry to Jesus and the angels happened. And just clowning on Satan like he thinks, man. He really thinks. He really thinks he had you, Jesus. He ain't got you. But what Satan was trying to do was he was trying to squeeze Jesus and test the level of worldliness that's in Jesus. He wanted to see if there was any sin or any world inside of him. Because Jesus later on, he makes a statement in one of his sermons. He says, what good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? So at that moment, what does Satan offer him? The whole world. But if he got the whole world, what would he lose? His soul, his mission to save the world of sin. And so that's what Satan will often try to do. He will try to tempt us with the things of this world to gain, but we'll ultimately lose. He'll say, oh, you want that, you want that attractive person? You're not happy with what your marriage is right now? Shoot, indulge, go have that person. What did you gain? You gained the world, but you lost your soul. 
You, oh, you want, you want some pornography? Man, go have some pornography. Go do it. Do it, man. You deserve it. You've been stressed lately. You want to drink? Go drink. Go help me get, get plastered. You've been working so hard. Go gain the world, man. Get whatever you want in this world. Do it. Go for it. But what are you going to lose? What happens? And it's only when you're tested and tempted does your heart become really revealed. Inside of you, what's revealed? That's when it really happens. See, as we begin to close with two illustrations today, you know, what happens is, is God begins to reveal inside of us the Greek word here that we just read today. The Greek word for testing and tempting, what Satan did to Jesus every time, is the Greek word perizo, P-E-I-R-A-Z-O, perizo. And what it means is to make proof of, test, or tempt. There's three words that it has a definition. It's depending on the context of the sentence that defines what type of tempting or testing or perizo that it is. In other words, another neutral word in the English language is cry. If I say last night I made my wife cry, some people be like, oh my gosh, you're so mean. But if I told you no, it's because I gave her a gift, a very nice gift. And she cried because she saw how much I loved her, it brought her to tears. She cried. But then if I say, but no, she cried because I left the toilet seat up for the hundredth time and she's fed up with me, she cried. Crying, crying is a neutral word. It, it can be done good and it could be done bad. Perizzo is the same way, testing. Uh, in, in other words, in the book of James, it says, consider it a joy, dear brothers, that when you face trials, it is testing that shows the proof of steadfastness in your life. So he says, count it a joy that when you're tested, perizzo, it's the same word. But when Satan comes to tempt, it's perizzo, but it's a negative thing. Satan wants to tempt you to pull you away from God. God wants to test you to see what comes out of you and wants to bring you closer to him. How do I know that? Read the entire book of Job. That's what the whole book of Job is about. Satan goes before the father and he says, I bet you Job only loves you because he's rich, he has a family, and he's got a wife, and he's happy. I bet you if he didn't have that stuff anymore, he would curse your name, God. And then God goes, why don't you go do whatever you want? Because I know my son Job, he's going to knock this out the park. And then when he does, through my testing, show that he can worship me still, I will give him a double full blessing in his life. So what was Satan's goal in the perizzo to pull him away from God? What was God's goal in the perizzo towards Job? to pull something out of Job that he didn't know existed, a worship for God that Job did not know was there. But the only way that that could be revealed was through tempting and squeezing of Job's life. That's when it's revealed. And so for you and I, what's revealed inside of us is not when times are good. It's when we go through a perizzo in our life and we're squeezed. Does it reveal what is really inside of us? You see here, right here, I have two very... Uh, I have two, two wet shirts right here. I mean, you can see them, right? It's like two simple black red shirts. They, they look exactly the same. You, you, you can't tell a difference between the two. They're just two wet shirts. But what happens is, is in one of them, when I squeeze it, there's something revealed out of it. It's the world. It's just dirt. And it's just uncleanliness. It's just cussing, it's just backbiting, it's anger, it's sin, it's addiction, it is dirty. But then when I take this other shirt and it begins to go through a perizzo, a testing, what comes out of it? Purity, righteousness, cleansliness. This is a response towards God that's full. And so there are often times through our testing, through the tempting, that it will reveal what level of the world is inside of us. And oftentimes people look good until they go through something in their life. That's when their heart is really revealed. And that's what Satan was trying to do to Jesus. What happens when I squeeze you and I offer you the world? What is going to happen to you? And Jesus reveals this. Nothing. He's cleansed. Jesus is a pure lamb. Jesus triumphs over sin. But then... There are times that we go through and the real us starts to become revealed. And it's shown through the squeeze. You know, I could tell my wife 
that I love you. You're the only woman for me. I would never, you're, I, you, you're, my, you're my everything, girl. But then when the most gorgeous girl in the world comes up to me tomorrow at lunch when I'm with a buddy and says, what are you doing later on tonight? And I pause and I go, I don't know, what are you doing later on? <laughs> the statement that I just made to my wife the night before is empty and worldly and vain because when I was squeezed, my heart was revealed. But when I respond, get behind these Satan woman, I'm married, I love my wife, I, I would never hurt my marriage and my kids, and I respond in a way that's pure, God looks at us and he goes, here comes that double full blessing. You've just revealed your heart, Adam. In the same way, when I come and I'm at the altar, I got my hands raised, God, I love you, you're my everything. But then Monday, it don't look like that. God, I love you, you're my everything. It comes in the squeeze. What happens when you're squeezed? What comes out of you when you're squeezed? What comes out of you when you're tempted? And there are people oftentimes where we're a perito ourselves. We're a temptation to other people ourselves. There are oftentimes girls that I follow that I love. They're from the church. And I follow them on Instagram because I love, like, they come to the church. And I'm going to be nice. We talk. And then they post like naked, half naked photos. And I'm like, you're, you're a temptation. You're a perito. What are you doing? We have other women in our church that have been saved from lesbianism that are trying to fight a daily battle to remain pure and they're following you back and they're seeing this and they're saying, well, they go to church. We ourselves can be perizos. We could be perizos in business. That man's a Christian businessman, but then we come and we start getting around and say, oh, they do business like that? Maybe I can do business like that because they're a deacon. They're an usher. So, I mean, if they can lead in the church, surely I can do like them. We can even be a temptation towards people. So that's why the word of God is supposed to be acted as a constant purifier in our life. Because what Satan tried to do was he tried to bruise Jesus' hill. But Jesus came out on top. He tempted him, tried to give him a little bruise. One temptation, two temptation, three temptation. Jesus won every time. It was a small little bruise that Satan tried. But there are often times Satan will try to tempt Christians and bruise them. And he succeeds. And there are a lot of bruised Christians in the kingdom of God. And as we close today, if you're taking your notes, I have an acronym also for bruised. Bruised Christians look like this. And really, worldliness is a sign of a bruised Christian. They look broken. A bruised Christian is broken. They're religious. I don't like that church. I don't like this. They got an opinion. Spend no time with God. Have no personal relationship with God. But they'll tell you all day why they don't go to church. They're religious. I don't like them big churches because they don't preach the word. What church do you go to? I don't go to church anymore. <laughs> well, you know there's not only big churches in the world, right? Like, they're religious. They're un undercover. Always hiding. I, I come in, I come out. I slip in. I don't want no one to know me because the moment people know me, I have to be accountable to people. And so I'm undercover. I, irritated, always irritated by everyone. Irritated by the person that sat next to me. Irritated by the person out in the parking lot. Irritated by the children workers and the way they chain my baby diaper. Irritated by this. Irritated. I'm irritated. I will, Raywin. S, they're sensitive. Always sensitive, always offended. Pastor, I got to tell you about one of your members. Not one of your brothers or sisters in Christ, one of your members. Or at work, I got to meet with you because I'm offended at the person next to me in my office. Always, always sensitive. Empty, empty. I'm just looking for anything to fill this void up. It's a bruised Christian. And then the last thing is demanding. My way or no way. They think everyone, everything, and every, uh, everything they encounter is like Burger King. They can have it their way. Demanding as you'll get out. I have to have this. I got to do this. I got to do that. That's the sign of a bruised Christian. How many of you guys know? You know, I grew up with my mom. I'd go to the grocery store, and I, I'd see older ladies, and I'd see older ladies at the grocery store, and they'd always be going like this. Maybe... They put it in their back. I'm like, Mom, why are there grimy hands over all the fruit? Why are they touching all the fruit? 
She said, well, they're, they're feeling to see if there are any bruised ones. And if they're bruised, they put them back because they don't want them. So if they're soft and mushy, they, they put it back in the thing. They, they only want one that's ripe. I was like, oh, okay. So how many of you know, guys know during the transition process and during the setup processes, there are many fruits that can bruise really easily just by a small squish or even a small drop. It can bruise very, bruise very easily. And that's a lot of Christians in the kingdom of God. One little failure, one little drop, one little mistake. I'm done. I walk away. I'm out of this thing. I'm out of here. The same way a peach. You take a peach, very soft, easily bruisable. It drops and it starts to juice out, starts to complain very quick, very soft, very sensitive, easily falls into temptation, any, any, any offer. Hey, you want to come do this? Oh yeah, I'm down. Very easily to being exposed and hurt. Kingdom of God has a lot of avocado and peach Christians. What it doesn't have is a lot of coconut Christians. A coconut, man, this thing, this thing has been created and meant to survive falls of up to 60 feet and still survive. And even more than that is its hard shell is so hard that when it falls, it's meant to keep its composure so that as the soil starts to evaporate it, it'll break it down. And the reason why a coconut has this large shell and it has an inner brown shell is that's a level of its seed. That's a seed. And so when the hard shell begins to decay, what happens is the seed begins to bear another tree that will have more fruit. See, for a Christian... I mean, these fruits, if they fall, they would spoil before anything could happen. But a coconut, because it has to fall from so far and it can survive those heights, it can still bear fruit. And that's the problem why so many Christians walk in defeat, walk in temptation, walk in failure. It's because they don't know how to survive the fall. Because we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have miscomings. We're going to need correction. We're going to make it just, it's going to happen. We're going to be tempted. But when that happens, are you going to bruise really easily and give up really easily? Or will you survive the fall and say, you can't offend me. You can't push me. You can't punish me. Satan, when you come and attack me, you can't get through this. When Satan tries to attack that avocado, that's guacamole real fast. Today's Cinco de Mayo. There's a lot of those being smushed up today. It's the reason why there's no single to mile for coconuts. It's too much work to get through to this thing. That's the way it probably should be for you and I. Very, Satan, Satan, try me. It's going to be very hard to get through me, Satan, because I have the word of God that I can wield as a weapon against you, Satan. And so, any fall, whatever it goes through, whatever happens, I'm not going anywhere. Why? Because I'm going to be like Jesus. Every time I'm tempted, I'm going to say, as it is written. And I'm going to quote the word of God. And I'm going to fight with the word of God. Because when, when Jesus is tempted and he quotes the word, then why should I think that I should be doing anything else when I'm tempted and going through trial? I need to quote the word of God. And that's what makes a raw question. One who's reliant on God, one who knows his authority, and one that does not let worldliness penetrate their heart. And says, Satan, you could throw whatever you want at me, and I'm not biting for it. Because I know who fulfills me and gives me purpose. And I know who to trust at the end of the day.